Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Stan Wong, and it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Born and raised in Oxford, Sir Tim Hunt read natural sciences at Cambridge, where he also completed his PhD. Prior to moving to Cancer Research UK Clare Hall Laboratories, he spent 30 years in the Department of Biochemistry at Cambridge, working on the control of protein synthesis and the cell cycle. With spells in the USA, Tim has spent time teaching and doing research at the Woods Hole Marine Biological Laboratory. In 1982, he discovered cyclins, a family of proteins that are key regulators of the cell cycle. For this work, he won the 2001 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, along with Paul Nurse and Lee Hartwell. Recently, Tim was the chairman of the Council of the European Molecular Biology Organization, and in 2011, was appointed a member of the European Research Council's Scientific Council. So without further ado, Sir Tim Hunt. I just thought I'd, uh, I'm, I'm neither as clever nor as funny as Sidney Brenner, so I thought I should show you. This is he sitting here. This is me, by the way, so I do actually know the gentleman. In fact, I've known him since I was an undergraduate. He used to have wonderful seminars in his rooms in, in King's, which we all sort of sat at his feet. And so he, um, he would be here if he could, but he's actually sick in Singapore, I gather. Too bad. Let's hope he gets better real soon. So this is actually a pretty funny, um, this is sort of, it's somewhat interesting actually for you. So this is the, uh, I guess this is the board of governors of something called the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. Okinawa, you may remember, is part of Japan, but it's a hell of a long way. It's sort of three hours flight from, from, from Tokyo. And unfortunately it's not shown here, but there was a, a Japanese minister for Okinawa who decided that the only way to pull Okinawa up by its bootstrap was to have a, a research institute there. So Mr. Omi uh, set up this thing. He also, I think, was a finance minister, so he could basically write any check he, he chose. And, um, and I got roped in via Sydney to, to, to go there. So it's been terrific fun. And unlike most Japanese universities, this one, the language is English. And uh, the idea is not only that, but half the faculty should not be Japanese. Half the faculty are. Japanese. So this is a very interesting experiment, and I'm going to go there in two or three weeks' time for another Board of Governors meetings. And the most fun thing is all these other characters, quite apart from Sydney, who is extremely funny. Our chairman is Torsten Wiesel. Torsten was the first person, really, to figure out how you can see things. Uh, this gentleman here, uh, Jerry, is um, a professor at MIT, and I was once in a taxi with him from the airport on Okinawa to the about an hour's ride. And I said, so Jerry, what did you win the Nobel Prize for? He said, well, I guess you could say my, my, me and my people were really the first people to come up with experimental evidence for the existence of quarks. So I said, whoa, <laughs> how did you do that? So I've heard the story. It's very, very interesting, absolutely terrific. This guy used to be the head of uh, Tokyo University. He's also a very accomplished poet, I gather, you know. And so they're all, and, and this man here is extremely interesting, Y.T. Lee. He comes from uh, Taiwan, and he's the only member of the board who can speak Japanese and read Japanese, Chinese, Russian, and English. Pretty fucking impressive. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really, uh, these, these characters actually run the place. <laughs> That's what they're doing here. Anyway, so this is, a, I warn you, this is going to be a scientific talk. And uh, let's see the first question. So yes, here we go. It's called... <laughs> <laughs> So I hope, I hope I can sort of keep you entertained for the next half hour or so. Um, so you might be interested, the price of gold has tumbled terribly recently, but it's still worth a lot more than it was in 2001. 
Um, I, the last time I looked, actually, this thing was worth, when I got it, it was worth £1,500. So I gave it away to my college because it was so trivial compared to the check for £200,000 plus that I got from the, the Nobel people. But my wife said I should find out how much it was before giving it away. So I did that. <laughs> but had I hung on to it, when the last time I looked, it was now worth £7,000. And I might have been more reluctant to part company with it, but anyway. <laughs> easy come, easy go, right? <laughs> so the uh, alternative title of this talk is uh, one of the referee's comments, and it's not the kind of referee's comment you really like to have on your prize, Nobel Prize winning paper. I mean, he didn't know that, and I didn't know that at the time, of course, but he said that one of the reviewers said it was wild speculation based on faulty logic, which is sort of interesting, actually, and it's always been my experience that if, as a scientist, you make an important discovery, it very often goes against the grain, and people really, there are two reasons why people don't like to believe it. First of all, it shakes up their ideas, and second of all, they're jealous because they didn't think of it. And that's a, that can be a, a, a problem. Now, I dare say, how many of you are actually scientists of some sort? And how many are not? Yeah, you see, see we've got a bit of the, 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 what I call the ambassador problem. So every so often I have to give a talk in front of an ambassador. And the ambassador, or oh, being very charming, but mostly being not scientists, you know, historians, economists, so politicians, that kind of thing, come up after and say, Tim, that was an absolutely lovely talk, but I didn't understand a word of it. <laughs> and I always wonder what it is that they didn't understand, you know, because you should be able to correct that. But I've never really been able to find out. And here is the, here is the problem, which is very nicely put by a, a Nobel Prize winning um, physicist, Pierre Gilles de Gennes, who unfortunately died two or three years ago. Science is clearly a form of art with the same invention and the same doubts. There are major differences, however. One is the difficulty of communication. An Indian playing his flute in the streets of Bogota invents a new tune. Within 10 seconds, passerbys may be struck by it, possibly for their whole life. But in our trade, he's a soft matter physicist. A beautiful discovery can be transmitted to only people who have been through a long specialized education. We must do our best to keep in contact with our fellow citizens, but we often fail. And that, that, that is so true. So I'm afraid that with some of you, I will fail miserably, and I hope that you know, enough gets through. I have the thing, actually, you don't, a lot, of, a lot of stuff is talked about public understanding of science, but in my experience, science is not easy to understand. For example, I have never been able to understand how light gets through the window, whereas it doesn't get through the brick. Um, it turns out that understanding how light, uh, it is very well understood by Nobel Prize winning physicists how light gets through the window. <laughs> but not by me it ain't, because it's sort of very deep into quantum mechanics actually and some nasty stuff. So, you know, don't, uh, science, don't let anyone ever tell you that it's, you know, the, the ideas are easy. Often you need uh, a lot of training. So I grew up, as you heard, in, 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 in Oxford and um, Spent quite a lot of time acting. That's me there at the age of about seven in Midsummer Night's Dream. That was my sort of first. And it turns out it's very useful. I don't know, so I'm sure some of you have been in plays at school. It's really helpful on occasions like this. I mean, it, 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 it gives you confidence performing before an audience. I've often wondered what happened to this very attractive young woman. Did she become a famous actress or did she fade into obscurity? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, this must have been about 1950 or 51, I suppose, something like that. That's my clicker. So the first, my sort of, I, I became a scientist really because of this chap here, Gert Sommerhoff, who was a young German scientist. He was in fact a sort of theoretical biologist, and he was hired by the then headmaster of the Dragon School. And uh, with the words, just get the boys interested. And that he did in spades. I mean, Goethe's lessons were very simple, very inspiring. They mostly consisted of explosions and smells and radio-controlled things. And there was a science club, and it was great. And I learned at the age of 11 
Um, as you see here, the, 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 we went, you know, physics was the first term, chemistry the second term, biology the third term. Luckily for me, uh, the final exam in the summer term was in biology, and I did terribly well. Although I was sort of in the middle of the school, the whole school took the same exam. Uh, and I did very well, and I realized that I was sort of good at biology without really trying. And it's always a very good thing if you find you're good at something out without really trying. It probably means you have some natural talent, and you can, you know, that's, I th I th you know, why, why struggle when you're not really very good at it? Because there's always going to be somebody better at things than you are, and you should really play to your strengths. Anyway, you know, we sort of fooled around. I loved, my bedroom was full of old radio sets. I would take them apart and then never be able to put them back together again. And this is one of Goethe's uh, things, which I think is really rather interesting, you know, that we, we live in a terrible age. I think scientific education these days is pretty awful, actually, because you're just not allowed to fool around that much, and people really need to have the space to, to fool around, I think. Um, Inventive children want to learn in a self-directed way and under their own steam, the best in them is stifled by preset routines. How true. And learning the skills, of course, is crucial, but the ideal time for that is after they've discovered the need for them in their own free endeavors. When you really want to know something, you know how to find it out. And it's easier than ever these days because of the internet and the ready availability of, of information. So anyway, um, one of the great differences between Oxford and Cambridge is that uh, whereas in Cambridge two-thirds of the people are scientists, in Oxford two-thirds of the people are not, and Cambridge is the university to come to learn to be a scientist. And anyway, I had to get away from home. <laughs> So, uh, and I used to, at one stage in my life often to walk through on my way to work I lived in Clare College and, and, and went to work in the biochemistry department. Walk, walk, walk through here, and I realised what an amazing place this was. Was I mean, I don't think um, Newton actually worked there, but there was this tremendous tradition here in Cambridge, um, starting really with Newton uh, and, and carrying on with, with with Maxwell, who who worked out that light was this mysterious combination of electrical and magnetic waves, something I also don't really understand. And then the electron was discovered here, the atomic nucleus was discovered here, the proton, the neutron, the atom was first split through that doorway. And then the physicists settled down to some biology and Watson and Crick famously uh, discovered how the two chains of DNA worked, uh, were wrapped around one another and Kendra and Perutz uh, worked out how to use X-ray crystallography to find the, the structure of proteins. So if you were feeling good, you'd sort of feel, you'd, you'd walk with your head held high and think, gosh, I'm a part of this grand tradition. If, on the other hand, you were feeling a bit down and things weren't going too well, it was really rather a heavy load to bear and you didn't really think you could ever possibly live up to this extraordinary um, uh, record of, 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 of fundamental achievement, the most fundamental and important kind in, in science. So me and my mates, you know, I mean, I, I, I never thought of myself as anyone terribly clever. I still, still don't. But, and, but, you know, you just sort of put one foot in front of the other and carry on. And I, being good at biology, as I've told you, and not bad at chemistry, decided to be a biochemist. And this was a very good choice, because I, I, I didn't realize it at the time, but actually we were just on the threshold of a great golden time in, in, in biochemistry. Almost nothing was known, and everything was to play for, because DNA had been discovered, messenger RNA had been discovered. It became clear that the way that the information in all your cells in DNA got out and got expressed was that DNA made RNA and the RNA made proteins. So I decided to work on protein synthesis. And uh, the first experiments I did actually were a ghastly failure because I didn't read the paper I was following correctly. It, uh, <laughs> you had to use, I was trying to make some my, make, uh, I was trying to bugger up the kidneys of the rats, actually, in which I discovered I hated rats, and they hated me. <laughs> Understandably, since I was trying to kill them. <laughs> um, 
and, it, and it, what I was doing just didn't work. So I used the wrong strain of rat, luckily for me. Actually, the problem I was working on still hasn't been solved, so I probably wouldn't have got my PhD, actually, so I wouldn't be standing here, here now. So luckily, the, the, I went to the first scientific meeting I ever went to, and it, it was here, it was actually held in 1965, and it was just down the road from where the lab was. It was on... on um, Lansfield Road in the chemistry lab. And there were lots of great talks about haemoglobin synthesis. Haemoglobin, for the non-scientists among you, is the stuff that makes your blood red and carries the oxygen. It's going to come back. Uh, and there were two talks that made a big impression. One that I didn't realize at the time was by this gentleman here, and we'll come back to him. He was a Caltech professor called Henry Borsuk. And the other, more immediately, was uh, by this character here, Vernon Ingram. And um, Vernon uh, was the man who discovered the molecular basis of sickle cell anemia. He discovered that there was a mutation in the hemoglobin, so it tended to precipitate when it was in its deoxy form. And he was trying to find out um, when the heme and how the heme controlled the synthesis of globin, because that had actually been discovered by, by, by Borsuk. If you starve red cells for iron, so they can't make hemoglobin, they could still make the protein, but they don't. And uh, so Vernon had this rather clever idea. I'm now going to sort of pretend to be there's a piece of messenger RNA to make hemoglobin, right? And ribosomes, the things that actually make the proteins, start at the beginning, go down the message, spooling out hemoglobin as they go, and it folds up as it comes out, okay? Now, the question is, heme actually binds about two-thirds of the way down the globin. So Vernon's thought was that what happened was the ribosome started down the message. Then when they got to the place where the heme ought to come in, they waited for the heme. And if the heme wasn't there, they'd just wait forever and form a cube behind them. Cool idea. Very cool idea. Was it true? Well, when we got back to the lab as graduate students, first year graduates, and we realized that actually he'd got his argument completely backwards. If anything, his data showed that the, ribos the ribosomes did exactly the opposite of what he, what he, he claimed. Uh, so thinking what an interesting thing, we decided, uh, did ribosomes ever form cues? So, um, I had uh, a, a couple of friends, uh, Lou Reichart, who is a really, he's now a neurobiologist at UCSF and a very good mountaineer, by the way. He's pointing at um, some stones that he collected from the top of Mount Everest in this picture, which I think is rather cool. He lost a few toes in the process, I believe. But, uh, and, 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 and Tony is a very distinguished biologist who was a year behind me, and we sort of collaborated in our PhD to try and find out if ribosomes ever cued and whether what happened if you, if you left the iron out of the medium. And we found that they didn't form cues and that they, the iron made absolutely no, no difference. So the whole idea was completely wrong. But it nevertheless introduced us uh, to the idea. Here's the haemoglobin and the, the four chains of color, yellow, blue, red, and green. They're very, very similar. And the heme there is that little thing you can see poking its nose out, just accessible to the oxygen. The oxygen was sort of bind right in there, it's on the surface. Okay, so uh, that was in 65. In the summer of 66, I went to another meeting, only this time it was in northern Greece. And um, they wouldn't let me into the meeting lunch because I hadn't paid my dues. I was just sort of gate-crashing the talks. And so I went to a nearby, uh, what are they called in Greece, you know? Taverna? No. I can't remember. Anyway, and got rather drunk on some very nice red Cena, and ran into Irving when he came out. And Irving said, you know, he, he'd evidently been impressed by the questions I'd been asking during the sessions. And he said, um, what are you going to do when you've finished your PhD? So I said, to hell with finishing my PhD. Can't I come and work in your lab this summer? So he said, well, why not? And so I did. And it was great. And I really liked going to America. And uh, this is the nearby subway. Stop. It turned out that his lab, unfortunately, was in the Far East Bronx, which is not exactly the most, you know, fancy labs in New York or places like Rockefeller. And this was sort of unfashionable. But it was very nice. Albert Einstein College of Medicine turned out to be a wonderful place to go because some terrific scientists there, and they were very friendly. And so, uh, and I got introduced to this problem, which was Borsuk's problem, really. You know, measuring time along the bottom here, 
and protein synthesis, the synthesis of hemoglobin up the side. And you can see if you have heme, which is the, that little blue job I showed you before, in the medium that protein synthesis goes more or less linearly for, well, in this experiment, half an hour. But if you leave the heme out, protein synthesis starts off all right and then curls over and more or less dies. So that was, the, that was the problem. What is the control mechanism? And what is also cool about this is if you add the heme back, it starts up again. So you can actually turn protein synthesis on and off by adding this, 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 this molecule. Okay? So um, after I graduated, uh, I went to work with Irving on, on, on this problem and actually made absolutely no progress whatsoever in solving that problem. It's often been my experience that the worst thing you can do in solving a problem is actually try to tackle the problem head on. So in, instead of tackling it head on, actually one just gets depressed and wants to try different things, um, I sort of helped other people around the lab. And the first funny one was, was this. This curve looks awfully like the previous curve, that is to say protein synthesis going on nice, at a nice high rate and curling over and dying here. But um, this came about by the addition of a completely different chemical. In, in this case, heme is present throughout, and we add tiny amounts of uh, something called oxidized glutathione. Um, and there was, I won't go into it why, there was a reason for, for doing this. It was a very strange result. Tiny, tiny amounts of this chemical. And it looked awfully similar, but there was, you know, the relationship was not at all clear. And then I got really sort of stuck and decided to... Um, map the genes of polio virus, in which, again, I failed miserably and utterly and completely. But uh, I had a good idea. The, the, the problem was I got some polio virus. There was a group that worked on polio in the lab. It went and got some RNA, and it should have made polio. Didn't make any polio that I could detect. Um, and I thought, well, it must be because rabbit red blood cells, that was the model system, uh, need things you'd find in a human cell. So well, let's take some polio. And since the human cells infected polio virus and making lots of polio proteins, they must have whatever factors you need. Turns out the logic was absolutely right. This, this turned out to be correct many years later. But meanwhile, I discovered something completely different. So I got some polio virus infected cytoplasm, added it into this... Uh, cell-free system, and instead of uh, promoting the synthesis of polio virus, it shut off hemoglobin synthesis. And it turned out that whatever it was was an unbelievably potent uh, inhibitor of protein. In fact, when we found out what it was, it was something called double-stranded RNA, which the polio virus has to make in the course of its replication. And actually, it turns out that this response is part of the normal response of your body that tends to resist virus infections. We have some wonderful things called toll receptors that know if you were infected by an RNA virus because they detect double-stranded <laughs> RNA, and it causes the cells, in this case, usually to commit suicide rather than to support the, the, the growth of the virus. I didn't, none of this was, this wasn't to be found out for another 30 or 40 years. Um, but you can see, it, again, it looks very much, the control makes protein synthesis a nice high rate, add double-stranded RNA, and it curls over and, 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 and dies. And uh, this was really a sort of great uh, an important discovery. It was particularly important because we could calculate how many molecules of this double-stranded RNA you needed. And the answer was one polio double-stranded RNA molecule could inhibit synthesis by 10 million ribosomes. Now, if you know that, you know something, those numbers are really important. There's no way you could fit 10 million ribosomes onto one little piece of double-stranded RNA. So there must be some sort of enzymatic amplification going on. And we had no idea what it might be. Okay? So uh, I then went back to Cambridge, rather with my tail between my legs, actually. You know, I hadn't been... I discovered these two curious things, but didn't really know what to, to make of them. And fortunately, Richard had come back. He was a fellow graduate student, but I think two years ahead of me. Jim Watson says, you know, you should always work with people who are cleverer than you are. This is terrific advice, and I strongly recommend it. So Richard and I made a great team, because I was always sort of trying to do broad brush ambitious things, and Richard was always getting us back down to earth and uh, filling in the, the details. Anyway, um, uh, we worked together very, very happily for, for, for a long time, and I realized that 
in the course of a long career, I've always been happiest when I've worked with two or one or two or three other people. Um, I don't like big teams because I, you sort of lose control, but having someone to share the triumphs and the setbacks I think is enormously, for me, uh, sort of psychologically rewarding and it's, 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 it's good fun. And then the lab burned down. Or up, was it? And uh, Richard rang up one morning and said, Tim, the lab has burned down. Don't bother to come in because there's nothing left. <laughs> but, and as you can see, I mean, there was some truth in what he said. <laughs> but actually, uh, we kept the really most precious samples in a liquid nitrogen dewar flask. It's a sort of thermos flask. And when I got there, I realized that this liquid nitrogen flask was venting liquid nitrogen. I mean, steam was coming out of it because it had, it had burst its um, seal so that it was no longer a, a thermos flask. But clearly, there was still liquid nitrogen. So the samples inside had been held at minus 196, whatever it is. Um, so we quickly found somebody who had a new one and uh, some liquid nitrogen filled them up. And the, so the most precious samples were, were safe. And within six weeks, actually, we had this wonderful sob story to tell. Dear Mr. Manufacturer, our lab has burnt down. What are we going to do? Can you give us a new centrifuge by next Tuesday sort of thing? And mostly, you know, you sort of ring up Beckman, who make these big instruments, and said, oh, we were going to sell five of these things to ICI. Well, you can have one of those. They, they're not going to care the difference between four and five. So, it was <laughs> <laughs> so we, did, we did terribly well. And the other thing which was really important was that we obviously had to move labs. So you don't mend labs like devastated like that in six weeks. So we moved up the road to the, to the hospital site. And that was fantastic because we were right opposite the famous laboratory of molecular biology. And Max Perutz, who was then the director, um, said that we could uh, you know, use his stores and have lunch in his canteen, which was absolutely great. More important than that, in some ways, was the fact that you know, we were actually pretty baffled by that time. We really hadn't made much progress in solving the central problem, which is what was turning protein synthesis on and off. Uh, and it burned all the old data, so we just sort of had to start afresh. Luckily, the graduate students had just graduated and had written their thesis before the fire, and so no serious damage was done. I think we lost one paper. It was worth it. It didn't really matter, actually. Uh, <laughs> So that was very good. And um, it was then that I sort of uh, got to know people like Francis Crick and John Gurdon and Sidney Brenner and, and, and characters really quite well. Because you'd sit down at the lunch table and these great scientists would come and chat and explain what they were doing, which was terrific. And I don't know whether it was there as well. Anyway, within about sort of six months, basically, we solved the problem and found out what the catalytic mechanism was. And this is where we do get a bit technical because this is the first of a number of one-dimensional SDS polyacrylamide gels. This was something that was invented uh, actually while I was a postdoc, and it was the first time you could really analyze proteins. Each one of these black spots is a protein, big ones at the top, small ones at the bottom. And what you can see here is that this protein here gets very strongly labeled with P32 when you add double-stranded RNA. So the, the answer was that an enzyme is activated by double-stranded RNA which puts a phosphate on one of the protein synthesis factors, and that basically shuts off that protein synthesis factor. So everything was solved. We had an enzyme which, uh, which shut off. This is, this is sort of what it looks like in chemical terms. Here's the famous ATP, the so-called energy currency of the cell. There's, there's the A, and there's triphosphate, PPP. Uh, this phosphate gets transferred. Here it is on a sort of model, an example of enzyme activation. Uh, this residue here gets a phosphate on it, and you can see there's sort of some very subtle changes, actually. You know, that loop has gone into a little different configuration. But this thing on the right, which to my eye looks exactly the same as the thing on the left, if you measure its activity, this guy is 100 times more active than that guy, simply because you put that one little phosphate onto it. Absolutely amazing. So it's very commonly used in, in our cells to turn things on and off. And the only trouble with it is, I mean, so if you, if you find out that's what's controlling things, that's what's controlling things, but it, it's sort of, you can't really predict because 
I've shown you a case of activation, but you can also inhibit things with phosphorylation. Sometimes phosphorylation of proteins allows them to stick together. Sometimes phosphorylation of proteins blows them apart. There's no, there's no rhyme or reason to it uh, whatsoever. So we organized a meeting to tell the world about these great results. And one of the people I invited was an expert on protein synthesis in sea urchin eggs. And the reason for doing that was because sea urchin eggs turn on protein synthesis when they get fertilized. And I'd learned that also from Borsuk's talk back in 1965. And so I lent Tom Humphreys, the expert, my bicycle. He wanted to rent a bicycle. At that time, you couldn't rent bicycles in Cambridge, believe it or not. Uh, and uh, we became friends because I liked cycling, he liked cycling, and I lent him his cycle. I mean, that's, that's how things happen in the real world. And it turned out that he was running a course in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, a very beautiful place to spend uh, summers, and I liked going to America. And he said, would I help come and uh, teach a course? So I did go and teach a course, and here I am teaching, well, not teaching the course, being photographed. <laughs> that's me there in my younger days, and actually a terribly distinguished crowd of people here. I won't go into them, people who became millionaires and very famous scientists and all and all, but the key people, that's Tom, the, my fellow cyclist, and, and Joan, who is now the director of the whole lab recently, and her graduate student, uh, Eric. And here's a sea urchin egg which is fertilized and speeded up tremendously, of course. And, and, and you can see it, 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 it's, it, divides. The first division will be about after an hour, and then it divides every half hour at regular intervals thereafter. Uh, fantastic. And here's the increase in protein synthesis. And we assumed that this would probably be the reverse of the phosphorylation that we'd found that inhibited protein synthesis. So we added P32 to the eggs, and sure enough, uh, one of the components of the ribosomes got phosphorylated. We, so we thought, oh, great, we solved the problem. You know, this is, we're, this is really too easy for words. It turned out, however, that was completely wrong. And when you're completely wrong, it always tells you that you're on the right track, because you sort of get very enthusiastic and you know, it, things look good, and then, you know, the, the, the evidence starts looking weak, and this turned out to be very weak evidence. But it was nevertheless thinking along the right lines. That same summer, um, we found some very interesting things going on in clam eggs, whereas the sea urchin eggs, you can see there's a big increase in the rate, but not much other change in protein synthesis. When you fertilize a clam egg, you, you see these three strong bands here called proteins A, B, and C. And I apologize for the extremely imaginative uh, naming convention here. They're not made in the unfertilized eggs, and about half an hour after fertilization, they start to be made. So this is really interesting. And um, we decided to start working on that without knowing what these proteins were doing or what they were for at all. And that very same summer, um, it's funny how things come together. It's all partly experiments, it's partly ideas. John Gerhardt came to give a talk, and he explained about these cells here. These are frog eggs. Actually, they're frog oocytes. That is to say, they're the precursors of eggs that you would find at around this time of year if you were to look at a female frog. Okay? And if you add progesterone, this has been discovered some years, hopefully that will do the trick. If I add, yes, I did add the progesterone successfully. This white spot forms. Not, you might think, terribly dramatic, but um, turns out the white spot has underneath it uh, a, a, a meiotic spindle. Here are chromosomes lined up on, on, on this structure. And what John did was to uh, explain how there was the progesterone turned on an enzyme that brought about this transition. It's really a cell cycle transition. We're activating the eggs in a cell cycle transition. And um, the only problem was they couldn't find out what MPF was because if you tried to purify it, it vanished. Very strange. So I thought, gosh, what a terrific problem, an enzyme that doesn't catalyze a boring reaction, as most of them do. Let's not beat about the bush. Uh, but an enzyme that catalyzes cell division. How terrific is that? And I longed to work on it, but I didn't because I couldn't because I wasn't, if you see what I mean. <laughs> and over the years, they discovered that MPF was really interesting. It went up and down basically every time the cell divides, whether it's a meiotic or a mitotic 
division. You see it comes up and it goes out. No idea what it is, what turns it on, or what turns it off. But at its height, it's catalyzing cell division. And then people discovered that it was present in starfish as well as frogs, so that was pretty striking, and then eventually that it was in human cells. So that apparently all throughout the animal kingdom, indeed, even going down to yeast and fungi and things like that, uh, you can find MPF when they're in the act of uh, dividing. And amazingly, you know, frog oocytes will respond to human or yeast MPF, so that's pretty cool. So, uh, basically, we're talking about one cell uh, becoming two cells, and the only trouble with that is quite complicated because you've got to do a lot of stuff for one cell to become two cells. You have to double everything, including the DNA, and this is a sort of typical cell cycle with DNA being synthesized during S or synthesis phase, and then the chromosomes being segregated during mitosis or, or M phase, with gaps in in between. And if you look at what's going on, this is a sort of a, a review. And the only really, I mean, forget about all this detail, it's complicated, it really is complicated, but what we're talking about is this trigger here. So what was the trigger? Well, luckily for me, and I hadn't really realized this, if we add sperm to these sea urchin eggs, you'll see some other thing. We've already seen dividing sea urchin eggs. I don't think I got the sperm in. There we go. Do you see how synchronous these divisions are? R virtually, except for that cell there, which didn't get fertilized. They, they go absolutely, the first three divisions or so are totally synchronous without you having to do anything except make sure you add the sperm and mix it up well. That's all you have to do. And uh, in the course of one sort of, I, I don't know what I was thinking of, but I did an incredibly simple experiment, which I, by this time, really knew how to do properly. Add, labeled amino acids now to those fertilized sea urchin eggs and take out samples every 10 minutes. And what I saw was, you see this band here, this is a protein of apparent molecular weight, 42,000 or something like that. It came up and then it faded away. All the other bands went on getting stronger. So I had discovered a protein that disappeared. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a Nobel Prize winning experiment. It was an experiment anybody could have done in the preceding 10 years, but they just hadn't because it was such a dopey, simple experiment, you know? Or they had no reason for doing it. And you would never have seen this if it had done it on human cells or yeast because these proteins aren't very abundant. But in this particular situation, they're really quite abundant proteins. And basically, it goes away just, this is cell division, you can see it goes away just before the cell divides. Here you can see perhaps more easily that it comes back again for the second division. And we could show it kept on coming and going very much like, I mean, so MPF did this and then went away. Here's a protein that did this and went away. I mean, you don't have to be a genius to think that there might be some connection between the two. Um, so, but there is a problem, which is that here I am, an expert on protein synthesis and its control, and I'm suddenly pitchforked into the business of cell cycles and its control. And uh, so what do you do? Well, you talk to people, you read their papers. So I read Lee Hartwell's papers. Here's Lee getting ready for, to deliver his Nobel lecture. And Lee had got mutants which control cell cycle uh, transition, and, and Paul, my former boss, uh, using a different yeast, uh, discovered further mutants, and in particular he isolated this mutation here, this strain of yeast in which um, cell division is speeded up, uh, and that made him realize that this was very important. And then he did basically discovered that um, there was another protein which so this is my protein in a human cell, and you can see that in human, this is a movie made by John Pines, my former graduate student, just down the road. You see how it comes, and then it goes out like a light. I think there's one more. Yeah. So it's the going away that it's explained. You make it, it comes, it goes away, and it goes away. So there are these two. That's John who made that movie. Uh, Jeremy who was the first person to clone... Uh, these, I, I called it cycling because um, it was really a joke because of the cycle, right? Basically. <laughs> and uh, here's my friend Andrew, who was an undergraduate at Clare, and I taught him. I was, again, very lucky having some incredibly talented uh, 
students. And Andrew did a wonderful experiment, which I'll, I'll show you. So it turned out that here are some frog eggs. Now they've, been, they've come out of the back end of a female frog in response to progesterone. Uh, you spin them and you get a beautiful layer of yellow cytoplasm. And if you add nuclei to that yellow cytoplasm, they form these lovely, lovely spindles. You see there are the chromosomes lined up in the two spindle poles with microtubules. Uh, in between. So this cell-free preparation will actually do uh, cell division cycles, and it's totally accessible. You don't have to do fancy micro-injection. You just pipette things in and out. And what Andrew did was to show that you needed protein synthesis to uh, drive mitosis, and that the only new protein you had to make, he took John Pines's clone from sea urchins, added it into the system, having destroyed all the endogenous messenger RNA, and showed that synthesis of this one protein was necessary and sufficient to drive cell cycles in, in this system. Moreover, he could stop the destruction by a mutation in the, in the protein, chopping off its front end. And in that case, if you can't destroy it, then you go into mitosis, but you can never get out. So Andrew showed that you need to make it and you need to destroy it for the cell cycle to, to go forward. And then basically, to cut a long story short, we discovered, I showed you already the activation of, of this, this thing. This is Lee and Paul's protein called uh, CDC2. And the phosphate, you may remember, went on here. But actually, the major activator is, it turns out, is cycling. The, the two of them form a PES. And my protein comes along, turns this one on, then it gets phosphorylated. Uh, then the cycling gets degraded and this turns off. So uh, what had looked unbelievably complicated turned out to be terribly, terribly simple once you under understood it. The cycling accumulates, CDK1 turns on, that's the thing on the left, and the cell enters mitosis, the cycling is destroyed, CDK1 turns off, and the cell exits mitosis. So that's all there is all there is to it. And when you make, I mean, nobody, the, the reason why this is sort of uh, a Nobel Prize winning discovery really is that nobody ever thought that you had to get rid of something for the, for the cycle to go round, right? I mean, you know, it just hadn't, it seems so improbable that it wasn't even considered as a theoretical uh, possibility. So I think I'll skip there and um, I won't tell you what we're up to uh, now, but just to sort of give you an idea of what scientific investigation is like and a terribly rapid thing but it, it really is you're sort of walking along this road and you know at some point you really can't see where it goes on from there you, maybe there's a precipice the other side maybe it winds down the hill maybe it turns a corner maybe it doesn't you just never go you just have to keep on putting one foot in the front of the other so science is uh, at the same time uh, terribly simple but also much harder than you might think to do well that's enough, I think. On behalf of the Global Scholar Symposium, Tim, I'd just like to present you with a token of appreciation for That's taking very the time kind of to you. spend with us. And uh, unfortunately, we're running a little we're bit behind. running miles behind. So now. we will not be able to take any questions at this moment. However, we we'll <laughs> might be able to do questions later. Uh, but I would like everyone to give Tim once more a round of applause. Thank you.